Uh, today we are happy to, to announce that we are featuring uh, two prominent scholars in their respective fields. Uh, the first one is uh, Bram Busser, Busser, Busser I'm sorry. Uh, he is the author of a super good book, Khaled, The Conservation Revolution, who has been published by Verso. He's the co-author of that book. And he has been doing a very interesting job conceptualizing that concept, as, as you will see in his presentation. And then we have uh, Peter Hoson, um, who is a professor on the University of Northumbria in Newcastle. And he has been writing about the relation between uh, crypto colonialism and surveillance, uh, philanthropy in the crypto world and its relation to the to climate. Um, well, I think that both of them fits very well in this conversation, uh, in this presentation. And well, Bram is going to start, and then Pete is going to continue. Uh, welcome, guys, and you can start whenever you want, Bram. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you so much, uh, guys, and 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 to the organizers for uh, for organizing. Uh, I really appreciate it. Also, to to share the stage with uh, with Pete, um, and um, hope to set him up uh, in, in my presentation. So um, yeah, I, I was just very honored and, and pleased to be part of the um, of the conference, and um, yeah, I, it's always a bit weird because you don't always see everybody who's who's online. But what I what I learned from ACAS is that there are many people from different sectors um, in the conference, including government sectors, actually talking about you know post extractivism, um, uh, unorthodox economic thinking. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. So yesterday, I actually sneaked into the meeting, to the conference as well, and I saw the present, some of the presentations by uh, Hayung Chan and, and and by others, um, uh, Kwan Graf, and that I actually really enjoyed. And also the introductory session with people from different government agencies and and from other sectors, actually talking about these things in an incredibly deep and meaningful way. And in fact, this morning I was talking to a, a Spanish PhD candidate. Um, who told me that the extractive question, the extractivist question, and that the resource question is a big discussion at the moment in Spain. And that she was really wondering why this debate was not actually happening here in the Netherlands. And I've been wondering that for about 20 years or so. So it's, it's really heartening to actually hear that these discussions are going on across the sectors in Chile and in, in, in Spain and in other, in other countries. And I think we can learn a lot from that. And I hope we, you guys can do something to break through that here in the Netherlands uh, as, as well. Um, so I hope to be able to contribute a little bit to, to that uh, discussion, uh, particularly by focusing on uh, the role of uh, global conservation. Right. So um, clearly conservation has often been seen as a sector that, that helps to move us beyond extractivism. Right, that 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 helps us to move, you know, beyond the current sort of extractivist economic model, in order to, uh, yeah, to save biodiversity, um, etc. And uh, clearly, right within the conservation world, people know, like I think many of us here, people know that business as usual is no longer tenable. Right, our human global impact on um, on the rest of the planet. Right is, is is dramatic and needs to be offset and balanced out in 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 one in you know uh, in in so many ways and the conservation sector is often seen to to do just this right to support this to balance out the environmental impacts of capitalism uh, by focusing on different ways to to save biodiversity, um, but for my research and and I think a, a big group that that Peter has also been a part of right we've asked the question can we trust capitalism to save nature? Can we see capitalist conservation, right, as a new development model beyond uh, extraction? Um, and I think the straightforward answer to that is no, but it's much more complicated than that, obviously. And I will try to show a little bit why. Um, uh, first and foremost, um, what is important to say in that respect is that capitalism and conservation have been historically intertwined since the beginning, right? So since the very start of the modern conservation movement based around protected areas uh, in, the, in the 19th century, 1850, 60, 70, um, 
capitalism and conservation have always sort of been deeply uh, in, intertwined and, and part of each other and influenced each other. But they are not often seen as such, right? Conservation is often seen as, as this do-good sector that fights to save nature from the causes of its degradation. And the question, of course, is, is whether that's true. Now, the answer that, it, that, that, that perhaps is not true is, is, is not straightforward. Now, why is that the case? Because at, you know, at this point in time, we see many capitalists, right, also having concluded that our current economic system actually leads to structural environmental degradation and social inequalities. Right. So if you take Al Gore and David Blood, for example, with their very famous, you know, ID manifesto for sustainable capitalism, right? They say that we need to get away from short-termism, build a more long-term responsible form of capitalism. And other initiatives like the breakthrough, uh, breakthrough capitalism and Plan B, also say that, and literally I quote, right, that, cap, that 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 current capitalism is failing economically, socially, and environmentally. And hence, you know, somebody like Peter Bucker, the president of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, says we need a revolution of capitalism. And and we've seen that many big capitalist actors have actually tried to do that, have gone out of their way to build a new accumulation model, a new way to accumulate that is green, right? We all know the big green sectors and, and, and green models nowadays, but we refer to this, uh, Rob Fletcher and myself refer to this specifically as accumulation uh, by conservation. And this has been going on for a long time, but really picked up over the last uh, last decades, um, in all kinds of ways, right? But particularly by um, by seeing how the, the transnational capitalist class and big consumer uh, interests have actually aligned increasingly with transnational conservation interests, right? To such a degree that sometimes they become increasingly indistinguishable. So if you would if you would go to the Nature Conservancy website, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the biggest you know, conser uh, conservation organization in the world today, uh, you, you will find literally on the website, and I, I checked this <laughs> an hour ago still, it says, quote, by working with companies, we can unlock financial, human, and natural capital to conserve lands and waters and ensure thriving communities. And then they list a whole bunch of partner companies. And that list is, is basically... I keep being astonished by that, but it's basically a who is who of the most dirty and destructive companies on the planet, including, and I kid you not, Shell, Amazon, Cargill, Coca-Cola, Dow, Nestle, BHP Billiton, a big mining company, and many others, right? And you see this with WWF, uh, Conservation International, and many other organizations uh, as well. At the same time, over the last decades, we've seen the language around conservation change a lot, right? New terms have arisen. They're not so new anymore, but they, they've become normal, including terms like natural capital, environmental services, natural capital accounting, uh, including through new mechanisms like, you know, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, Red Plus and, and PES payments for ecosystem services. Now, we'll be saying a little bit about that, but not going into too much detail. What I basically want to argue is that that model is deeply contradictory as it actually depends on continued and intensifies resource extraction consumption and problematically further stimulates a deeper alienation uh, from nature, from the rest of nature. Um, that's the one element. And then the other element is that I believe that these things are currently further being further intensified in a very rapid way uh, and, and rendered more complicated by digital platform and crypto uh, technologies. But I hope Pete will talk much more uh, about that. So I will discuss our ideas about accumulation by conservation a little bit more and show some of those contradictions, um, uh, particularly also in between, you know, uh, the, the so-called global north and global south and how, how you know, how, how this type of conservation works across, you know, the globe and inequalities within the globe globe and how this is currently being further uh, intensified. So starting with accumulation by conservation, what, you know, how do conservation and capitalism relate and how have, how, how, how have they become sort of you know, part of this 
you know, profess a new model of accumulation. And to, to help me um, explain that, I want to, um, to share my screen um, very briefly, hope that works, that everybody can see this. So here you have uh, basically the model that Rob and I developed uh, on uh, accumulation by conservation. And it's really based on yeah, world systems thinking, particularly Giovanni Arrighi's groundbreaking work, where he looks at particular you know, regimes of global capitalist accumulation and the global you know, hegemonic powers that, that, that drive them and how over time right, they give way to others when their contradictions start to impede the potential for profit and, and growth. Um, and of course, with Giovanni Arrighi's world systems model, Right. Um, the idea, of course, is, you know, that this happens on a global scale with global hegemons, but within these longer term um, uh, accumulation strategies, there are actually, you know, uh, smaller or, or, or shorter regimes of accumulation as well. And that is what we focus on here in, in, in our uh, particular model. So what what we've tried to show here is. Um, how you know from the 1860s as i said before from from the start of modern conservation uh, this can be contested obviously but right the first protected areas sort of really come from from this uh, this time uh, up to up to now we've seen three sort of major regimes of accumulation if you take you know sources like mondell leshen uri uh, david harvey Arrighi's work and others um, as, as your starting point so from the 1860s to the 1960s, really sort of colonial, you know, Fordist organized type capitalism, uh, capitalism that were characterized by vertical integration, uh, statism, state-led, right, top-down and very, very violent. Um, and this is where we believe, you know, that the fortress conservation approach come in, comes in. Also, you know, very top-down, often by, by state and incredibly, uh, incredibly violent. But we also see other for other forms of conservation, including you know emerging uh, wildlife tourism uh, happening. Now, interestingly, you know in the 1970s, you know the very early sort of start 60s, 70s of the sort of neoliberal counter revolution, if you will, you know saw a change to a regime of post Fordism, or what some have referred to as disorganized uh, capitalism, characterized much more by flexible forms of uh, accumulation and decentralization uh, guided by you know neoliberalism but a particular sort of form of uh, rollback neoliberalism that really had to break down that central state and devolve you know power particularly to the to 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 to, to the private sector but across all layers of society and then later which is what the rollout neoliberalism represents obviously sort of reassemble the state, but now in neoliberal form. And this really happened between the 1970s, of course, and the, and the, and the early 2000s. And we see conservation following suit. Right? And we refer to that as, as flexible conservation, moving away from, uh, from, from, from broader you know, emphasis on fortress conservation, also understanding, you know, and actually to a, to a good degree, um, um, like what we see with decolonization, right? Um, uh, sort of admitting the incredible violence of um, uh, of fortress conservation and of colonial forms of conservation, and trying to rectify that in some way or another by incorporating other actors into a broader, you know, form of uh, of capitalism. And we see this, you know, in conservation with a focus on community-based conservation or integrated conservation and development projects, ICDPs, right? Whereby um, ecotourism, again, play, uh, plays a, an incredibly important role, but whereby devolvement and decentralization are absolutely critical. Um, I've, you know, done quite a lot of work in the beginning of my career on trying to see, you know, why, why didn't this work, you know, because in principle, I think many of us would agree that it's really critical to put local communities, indigenous communities at the center of, 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 of conservation, right? People who live with, you know, biodiversity, that they, that they are the, the main stewards. 
But in a way, what this model also did right, is to make local people responsible for protecting biodiversity, right? And having to deal with the pressures, you know, from outside on that same biodiversity at the same time, right? And they would be offset, you know, through market-based uh, mechanisms, uh, basically. So that, you know, is what we refer to as, 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 a, as, as flexible forms of, of conservation, right? Decentralized, et cetera. Now, since the 2000s, we believe that that has, again, not given way. I mean, so we believe that fortress and flexible conservation still exists, right? We still have a big emphasis on 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 protected areas, in, in the, you know, and, and in fact, even bigger now. Uh, um, um, uh, and I will say a bit more about that just now. And also, of course, also community-based conservation has not gone away. Um, but the real sort of focus of, yeah, mainstream conservation, if you will has moved moved elsewhere and and we refer to this as fictitious conservation um, this is certainly not a term that's used in the conservation uh, community uh, obviously um, but you know through things like payments for ecosystem services uh, red plus that i mentioned before uh, reducing emissions from uh, deforestation and forest degradation through the international carbon market um, forms of species or wetland banking and other financial mechanisms you actually see how a broader form of financialization or casino capitalism focused on you know forms of spectacular accumulation networks etc is reflected in in conservation and we refer to this as fictitious conservation for many reasons but two two in particular um first of all uh, because it's a, for, it's a form of conservation that sort of profits from um, uh, and financializes nature twice, first by degrading it and then by, uh, by kind of uh, by, by conserving it all the while. And that's the second, po uh, second uh, idea about fictitious, all the while not actually making a major positive change in the meantime. Right. So climate change, as we know, has not stopped Ex the extinction crisis has not halted. I mean, some species perhaps have, have not gone extinct, you know, that, that certainly has happened. Um, but the overall problem hasn't, um, hasn't gone away. So for us, that is the kind of you know, fiction about, about this form of, of, of conservation. But even more literally, is that the value attached to moving beyond extractivism, the value attached to moving beyond um, 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 you know, sort of the business as usual is actually completely severed from what is actually happening on the ground in actual ecosystemic uh, e ecosystems and uh, and actual spaces, and mainly also in the uh, in the global south. Um, so this this is this is you know how we see uh, fictitious conservation is analogous to fictitious capital, right? Fictitious capital is capital that is put into circulation without having yet a basis in material production, um, right? That's mostly in terms of uh, loans and in, and in terms of debt. Now, of course, we live in a huge debted, you know, uh, debt-filled economy. And fictitious conservation is a bit the same, right? It's, 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 it's sort of placing value on greening things, on conserving nature, right? In, in, in a way that makes the value that is that is generated through that by you know selling commodities or speculating financially on on forms of conservation completely severed from the actual realities of conservation in actual places right there are still some links that that that, that you can make but for those of us who um, who are involved in this for example by offsetting our flights, we have no idea where that offset is actually going and where there are trees planted, etc., and what effect that in the end really has locally. And so that is also what we try to um, um, what we try to convey with the idea um, of, of fictitious conservation. But for us, there's an even bigger element here, and that is that um, we actually question through this approach whether the goal is conservation in the first place, 
right? Where the conservation is the goal to begin with, right? So these forms of conservation, fortress, flexible, and fictitious, are counterweights, sort of reflections of these regimes of accumulation in some way or another. And you can also see them as Polanyian counter movements, right? To offset and again, balance out the extractivism that happens through these regimes of accumulation. Um, but, you know, and that, that certainly plays a role. Obviously that plays a role, but we also argue that at the same time, through forms of conservation, you actually open up new possibilities for profit, for growth, for value creation, right? They may be fictitious to some degree, but nonetheless, there, there are often significant uh, funds involved nonetheless. And so, you know, this becomes a new logic of accumulation altogether. And that's why we refer to that as accumulation uh, by, by conservation. Um, all of this, right, as I've tried to show also, doesn't actually solve the problems that it refers to. Localized, there may be positive impacts here or there, but it actually hasn't stopped the climate crisis and or hasn't stopped uh, the extinction crisis uh, in, in any way. And in fact, um, um, I would argue, uh, together with Rob and others, that it actually leads to some major uh, contradictions. And I just want to name just a couple to give you a bit of an idea uh, about the kind of contradictions this model of accumulation of by conservation is steeped into. Um, first, and I think this relates directly to the conference, of course, it depends fully on resource extraction and extractivist lifestyles, right? In many, many ways, but I, I will not go into too much detail here, but in its most basic level, it means that, that economic growth becomes necessary to actually pay for environmental conservation and protection, right? That you first need to destroy in order to have the money to be able to protect. So that is the most fundamental contradiction there. And I don't know about, all of you, but I, I see these kind of examples all the time. I mean, literally last week here at, at my university at Wageningen University here in the Netherlands, we were asked to come up with proposals for the so-called Dutch Growth Fund, a major sort of fund, uh, literally, mil, literally billions of, of euros to stimulate cutting edge uh, science that needs to stimulate economic growth. And on their website as well, it says literally, Economic growth is necessary to pay, you know, for example, for climate, to tackle climate change, to tackle the extinction crisis, you know. And this is such a fallacy because if you look at the only significant blip in CO2 emissions over the last decades, you can see that, that was from a COVID-induced economic contraction two years ago, right? So that that is a, a really a fundamental uh, contradiction, but it also translates into other really weird and funky contradictions that I see in my research all the time. I just want to mention, a, show you a couple. So here's one from my research in Southern Africa. So this is a, a new gated estate. So in South Africa, this is a new new thing. I mean, gated estates, you know, you have everywhere. Of course, uh, Latin America has many of them as well. South Africa also. But uh, in, in, in several places, they're building new, what they call wildlife estates, where part of it, you build houses, um, and the other parts you build, um, uh, you, you, you keep open for so-called wilderness. Um, and here you can see that, that the green, and it goes further down to the, to the, uh, to the south, is the, uh, is the wilderness area, and the rest is all, all houses. And so these are the kind of pictures that they use on their website but you know, it's a bush and arrow estate. And on their website, you know, it shows a big four by four driving into the estate. Um, and then it says move to sustainability. <laughs> and in fact, you can own your own private plane and land it on the airstrip and move it into your private, um, private hangar before going to your house. Uh, so this is, this is of course, you know, like true uh, sustainability uh, elite style. Uh, and it's all part of a bigger so-called wildlife economy in South Africa that is currently being uh, being pushed quite hard. So here's um, a um, cartoon from the government. Uh, there's wealth in wildlife. 
you can't probably read much of it. But the interesting thing for me is, is this, you know, the animal equals rand. The R is, is the South African valuta rand. So, you know, the animal literally equals money. And then it shows all the, the ways in which you can benefit from, from wildlife, right? ecotourism, hunting for meat, breeding, sales, et cetera, skin and hide production, uh, products, et cetera. So again, you know, a way in which accumulation by conservation becomes, um, you know, manifest and actually depends on forms of uh, extraction. Now, if you want to uh, take it up one notch still, I found this one, uh, uh, particularly in relation to my extinction research, that I thought was also particularly interesting, that instead of, you know, thinking that our lifestyles are uh, problematic when it comes to um, species extinction, um, for the rich, you can actually go on a, on a yeah, relatively private wildlife safari around the world by private jet, you know, for 160,000 US dollars uh, per person for a 24 day uh, excursion. And you literally go around the whole world looking at extinct animals, uh, endangered animals before they genuinely go extinct. So if somebody has 160,000 to, to spend, here's a way to do that. But if you have a little bit less, of course, you can also still go to, uh, to, to the south of Chile where the last wilderness is also you know, always um, you know, something that these kind of companies like Abel Crompy uh, and Kent like to market uh, as the last wilderness. And this only costs uh, 10,000 uh, per person. Um, anyway, uh, those are just some, some examples and, and, it, and it seems to become wilder and, and wilder uh, very often um, in terms of you know the contradictions of you know resource extraction and consumerist lifestyles that are part of this new sort of economy that is still being built. Now, second, because right, I know I'm 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 running out of time. Uh, another contradiction is is ABC's uh, accumulation by conservation's reliance on inequality, right? And particularly here, the relation between the global north and the global south that I alluded to earlier becomes really important. And this is an argument that that Pete has made, that many others have made, including uh, in one of the very first real important articles by, by Kathleen McAfee uh, called Selling Nature to Save It. And she literally argues in her paper, and I went back to check it because I still think it's a powerful piece, quote, that in the market world imagined by proponents of global environmental services, trade, labor, land, and lives are cheaper in the global south. So in order for biodiversity and carbon offset markets to work as an efficient climate mitigation strategy, they must remain cheaper there, right? So the profits earned by buyers and brokers, the pro, uh, premium mobile of uh, environmental services markets depend on this ongoing inequality, end quote. So Kathleen and others have been making this argue, argument again. And in fact, Molly Dewayne uh, also used the term accumulation by conservation to actually say that another form of inequality in which this happens is that um, enclosure of value actually happens, quote, when environmental organizations from the global north appropriate land in the global south that is already well preserved. And we see this a lot now as well. So, so protected areas in the global south that are already quite well preserved now become uh, forms of legitimation for selling carbon credits and other forms of um, uh, biodiversity credits to organizations to, to basically keep polluting. So this allows capitalist elites in the global north to buy themselves out of uh, environmental problems and actually create new markets for profit in the, in the process, accumulation by conservation. A third contradiction is that this actually relies on a deep alienation of nature. I, what I want to argue here is not just that this is some, some estrangement from the rest of nature as a byproduct, but this is its explicit objective, right? If you take nature and, 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 and biodiversity markets, uh, climate change markets seriously, then alienation is actually the sine qua non of these markets, right? Because the best markets are those globally that are liquid, that allow for a fast turnover of goods and services. And the basis for this fast turnover is a willingness to be separated from a good or service, to render it open to market exchange, to be alienated from it in order to allow somebody else to temporarily own or enjoy it with the 
emphasis, of course, on temporary. So to think of this as the, you know, um, type of alienation in relation to the basis of life, right? Biodiversity and ecosystems that sustain us all is deeply contradictory. Now, not all conservationists buy this. I just want to make that remark. Not everybody is fully on board with this. Chris Sandbrook and others at Cambridge have done important work to show that within the conservation community, a lot are actually um, very skeptical of this as well. So this is not a one-way picture um, at all. Um, uh, and in fact, over the last years, as I mentioned before, a lot of um, conservationists have actually sort of said that we must go back to protected areas. Um, but our argument in terms of accumulation by conservation has also been that protected areas or the fortress conservation model was part and parcel of capitalism from the beginning and so cannot be the way out. And I want to briefly show and hopefully give you some evidence of why this is why this is the case, why increasing the protected area state will not get us out of the biodiversity crisis um, and out of the problems with, with, with an extractivist model. Now, this is the, the famous um, uh, set of graphs from the Great Acceleration, uh, part of broader Anthropocene uh, debates. I think it was alluded to yesterday, and perhaps it's hard to read, but basically here you see all kinds of socioeconomic and earth system trends, right, from GDP, energy use, water use, right, to all kinds of forms of ex extraction, right, tropical forest uh, loss, shrimp agriculture, um, uh, nitrogen, etc. And they all, you know, have this hockey stick graph, right, they, from the 1750s, you know, go, you know, upwards slightly, slightly, and then from the 1900s and 1950s, strongly upward. Now, there's a lot to be said to critique this because this may seem that it's just one type of picture and the picture is, of course, very uneven globally. Um, but what this shows, again, also to elites, is, of course, that, that this is completely unsustainable, right? That this kind of extractivist model is completely unsustainable. And we have seen that, obviously, it has had impacts on biodiversity, and the current biodiversity crisis that subsequently show exactly the same graphs. So here are some graphs about extinction crisis that we're currently going through. Um, on the left is the conservative and on the right is the, 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 the very conservative estimates. But again, you see from the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, strong upward movements uh, of extinctions across different species categories in relation to the background extinction rate. So keep that in mind, because the next slide actually shows you the growth of protected areas since 1911. And here you have exactly the same hockey stick graph, right? So the green are the terrestrial, the blue, the marine biodiversity, uh, 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 total uh, areas under, under some form of protection globally. And the red line is the cumulative total. So what this shows, for me at least, is that exactly in the same time as we see the growth of protected areas, you know, we see all of these things happening. Right? So they're not separated from each other. And perhaps the conservation movement could say, you know, if it wasn't for protected areas, it could have been even worse. To me, I don't find that a very convincing uh, argument. You know, support the conservation uh, community. It could have been worse. I don't think that that is, um, that is the way to go. So, you know, all of this, I think, shows for very clearly that um, you know, the accumulation by conservation model is highly contradictory and is, um, is, is not a sustainable model. Um, I want to, I think, finish here because the time is, is more or less up. Uh, but more recently, I have um, argued that new technologies actually really sort of push this uh, quite a bit. Uh, I've talked a lot uh, in my work about what I call nature 2.0, which is how digital platforms basically turn, you know, our experiences with nature into very lively spectacles, whilst at the same time turning them into, you know, data and algorithmic choices. So the way I actually refer to nature 2.0 is the lively spectacle of dead natures, an intense contradiction 
whereby the environmental crisis right, um, becomes a spectacle uh, in and of itself. And this can be taken one step further still into the crypto world, but that I will leave to, um, to Pete uh, to do. So I, I basically want to want to leave it there, but maybe just to say that we also have been thinking a lot about ways to get out of this. Um, because this is a bit of a de depressing picture. And after studying this for 15 years, uh, personally, and but also Rob felt, Rob Fletcher felt that, you know, and many others, that it's, it's important to think about, you know, ways to get out of this. So in our book, The Conservation Revolution, we've also come up with an idea around convivial conservation that is really beyond growth, you know, but also beyond the nature people dichotomy and tries to integrate nature and people within a different economy um, uh, as a new sort of vision uh, going forward for conservation that also at the same time learns a lot from um, indigenous peoples and other ways of living with nature around the world. Um, so thank you so much for uh, again for the invitation and, and for the attention and I, I look forward to, to your presentation Pete and, and to the discussion. Okay, so many things, Bram. So, Pete, now the stage is yours. Okay, you can hear me okay? Perfectly. Lovely. I'll just bring up my slides. Are we good? Great. Thanks very much. So my name is Pete House and I'm a senior lecturer in international development at Northumbria University in Newcastle in the UK. I'm very honoured to be a panellist with Bram. I don't think I've ever written anything that doesn't draw on some of Bram's ideas um, and today is no different at all. So I'm going to be discussing my current research, which takes this idea of accumulation by conservation and looks at what blockchain has got to do with it. I'm going to look at all the many ways blockchain is being used in carbon markets. So crypto carbon, I call it. Um, crypto giving, so this is fundraising using cryptocurrencies for conservation. And also the possibilities for using blockchain and cryptocurrency for degrowth. Um, I've pitched this at people with no background at all in blockchain and cryptocurrencies, so we can all have a nice time, even if we don't have um, any technical knowledge of these ideas. Um, there is a, a growing number of ways that this technology is being used, and I want to talk about all of them, um, which is quite ambitious. I, this might feel a bit rushed. I, I hope it, it doesn't too much, but we can connect later if there is any um, questions or if we want to continue the conversation somewhere else. So I started my research career uh, looking at Red Plus. So this is uh, a reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, Bram spoke about that. Um, this was in Kalimantan, uh, uh, in an area of Indonesia. Um, specifically the Rimbaraya Red Plus project. And um, I've always been a very deeply cynical and pessimistic, grumpy old man, even as a young boy. Um, and this project that I was looking at, Rimbaraya in um, Indonesia, they started using cryptocurrencies and blockchain as a way of trading their carbon commodities that they were producing. And I actually, at that point, when I found out they were doing it, I had a little glimmer of optimism in my eyes. And I thought, actually, this could actually be very exciting. Um, and it could make perhaps the green economy work. Um, but I was foolish. Um, and I shall explain why uh, over the course of the next half an hour. Um, so why blockchain? Well, there's many reasons for this. It is right now um, a hard time for voluntary carbon markets and conservation and other charities globally. There's uh, lockdowns, which mean that people aren't taking parts in fundraising events. So charities are having to be a bit more innovative in the way they fundraise. Um, people are fearing an economic slowdown. They're being more thrifty. They're not donating. Governments are cutting 
green taxes, especially in the UK, um, because of this cost of living crisis that we keep hearing about in the news here. Um, so COVID is coinciding with a general mistrust towards conservationists, perhaps rightly so, carbon markets in particular, um, and, and the non-profit sector generally is getting a lot of flack. Um, they've been embroiled in these big scandals. You may have heard of the Oxfam scandal involving abuse claims in, the, in areas of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Haiti. Um, there's been scandals involving um, torture and murder at the hands of WWF paid um, security forces around their protected areas. Um, these, these are all fueling a, a general mistrust. Um, but whereas a cost of living crisis, global economic slowdowns, all of these scandals, these are all observable, having a big impact. There's been a massive growth in speculative investment in crypto assets. Um, it was only a couple of years ago where I would explain to people, oh, I'm looking at blockchain technology. And they would look at me blankly and usually glaze over or just walk away. Um, and now it seems when I explain my work, even to my granny, she knows what I'm talking about. And she tells me about some dog money that she's investing all her pension in and things like that. Everyone knows about this. Um, it's very odd. There's lots of newcomers that are now super rich early adopters in this space. Everyone's getting involved. Um, so what what is it then? Sorry if you know what it is, but I'll explain um, very briefly. A blockchain is an append only digital database. That's it. It's very simple. Um, it removes the need for intermediaries. So we don't, we no longer need bankers or regulators or governments, um, or traditional regulators to verify transaction. Um, a blockchain is the backbone of cryptocurrencies. And cryptocurrencies, if you don't know, these are systems of digital money that don't need banks. So instead of banks, the job of keeping the books is outsourced to a global network of competing computers using a lot of energy. We'll get to that. Um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, you've also heard of. This is a stupid NFT here, the one with the balls. Um, this is the most uh, expensive NFT ever auctioned. It's, uh, it was sold for 91 million. You could buy several private jets or you could buy this image or you can right click on it now for free if you like and keep it on your computer forever. But someone paid 91 million for this. Um, these balls don't move, by the way. That's it. That's all it does. Um, Non-fungible tokens are like cryptocurrencies, only the tokens themselves are not interchangeable. So there is, it's deliberately done that way to maintain an artificial digital scarcity. If you remember um, downloading songs for free or even earlier, where you could put a cassette in a radio and download the charts every week, you do that for free. Um, NFTs are designed to stop people doing that. So they create this... Um, I guess if it's a word that I'll just make up, um, copyability, it prevents that. Um, some blockchains like Bitcoins, they just keep a record of digital transactions that are going on um, on a network. Others are more fancy, like Ethereum's, still uses the same underlying technology. Um, but Ethereum, they, this blockchain can facilitate smart contracts. So a smart contract, this is where blockchain tokens are encoded with conditions. Imagine that a Bitcoin is similar to the money that's in your pocket. You can go to the petrol station and buy petrol with it, and then you can get the change and buy a packet of sweets. No one's monitoring you. It's not encoded. You're free to spend it however you like. Um, but with smart contracts, you can encode the tokens with conditions. You could only spend those tokens on rice, for example. This is something I made up, but you could encode it to do anything. Um, and you can use these smart contract databases as like escrow accounts. So you could potentially, for example, um, disintermediate um, estate agents, for example, and you could replace them with these sort of escrow accounts. So if you 
put the money in one account, it releases the keys from a key box, for example. A, a, a smart contract could do all of that. So there's also things like DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations, DeFi, uh, decentralized finance applications. These are all booming. You may have heard of them, you may not. We don't have time to talk about them now, but they're especially becoming more and more common in the conservation world. So these are things you really want to be keeping an eye on. Um, okay, so if you do know about cryptocurrencies and blockchain, many of you probably do, you're probably thinking, what has this got to do with climate finance and carbon trading? Because doesn't Bitcoin use the same amount of energy as the whole of Thailand? Um, well, it does. Yes, it uses 204 terawatt hours of electricity every year as of today. And it's going to keep going up because it doubles every year on average. Um, so it's I would say um, that proof of work, which is the mechanism that uh, the consensus mechanism that's used by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, this is the most wasteful and purposefully polluting technology ever invented. 100%. Um, 204 terawatt hours a year, 115 million tons of CO2 just from Bitcoin alone. Um, so Bitcoin uses the same amount of energy as all the world's data centers combined. Um, the most Europe's most polluting power station, which is a coal-fired power station in Poland called Belkatau, I probably spelt it wrong there, Bitcoin uses four times, sorry, it releases four times more carbon into the atmosphere than this power station. Incredibly dirty. The, the, the most terrible thing about this technology isn't just the energy use and the carbon emissions, though. It's also the amount of e-waste so um, there are two and a half million machines that are working full hog, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. 98% of those machines that are currently being used to mine Bitcoin and other proof of work cryptocurrencies will never produce a single Bitcoin. 98% will go in the bin after their short lifetime, about a year or two, having not done anything of any value. Um, so it's incredibly wasteful. How can we possibly use this for um, climate change mitigation? Um, it's very laughable, but people, some people are doing it. So proof of work is proof of waste. There's no banks, so computers compete for bookkeeping jobs. There's big rewards uh, for keeping the books. So the amount of people interested in taking, uh, in, 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 in doing proof of work mining is doubling every year. With each new miner, the difficulty increases. Think about it like this. I don't know if this is just an English game or you have this in other countries, Hungry Hippos. Um, if there's just three or four of us playing Hungry Hippos, it's quite an easy thing. You just press the button, you win. Everyone wins something, some more than others, but you all get a go. But the more people, imagine that this is an infinitely growing game of Hungry Hippos, the more players that join, the harder it gets to win anything. And the number of balls available decreases over time. So there's currently 6.25 up for grabs every 10 minutes, but two and a half million miners are having a go. So the chances of you winning anything are tiny. Um, and the more players that join, the harder you have to press the button to try and win something. Um, if a green miner comes along, so they're powering all their machines using, using renewable energy, it still increases the carbon footprint of the network overall because everyone else, usually using coal, has to use more coal to make sure they can press the button as hard as they can. Proof of work is proof of waste. We argue in a recent paper, preying on the poor opportunities and challenges for tackling the social and environmental threats of cryptocurrencies, that Proof of work needs to be banned soon as possible. Um, so there are plenty of blockchain developers that are still using Ethereum and Bitcoin for climate change mitigation. And these are the proof of work cryptocurrencies. Completely bizarre. Yes, totally uh, bizarre contradiction. But there you go. 
Um, but what you come to realize is that a lot of crypto people, they embrace these contradictions and are very averse to reading anything, any of the important work that people like Bram and Robert Fletcher and others have done in the past to try and show that, you know, there are fundamental problems with using technical fixes for um, politically induced environmental change. Um, they'd ignore all of that. As if, if something was written more than a few days ago, it can safely be ignored as something that's in the past. It's history. Don't worry about it. Um, so many are trying to fix climate change with carbon markets as if that's something we haven't tried before. Um, but they see it as a very new thing. There are other options. There are climate smart blockchains, which we'll talk about later. But there's there are... Um, this in this paper here, uh, crypto carbon from a few years ago, I wrote with colleagues. Um, it focuses specifically on how crypto people are using cryptocurrencies and blockchain in order to fix the mechanical faults with Red Plus. So Bram talked about Red Plus uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. This is an idea of making forests in the global south because that's where forests are cheap and labor is cheap and um, and everything else that you need to make a carbon commodity. So it's making those forests more valuable standing than cut down for things like palm oil and timber and things like that. So the idea behind this Red Plus uh, carbon offsetting scheme is that you, you, you allow markets to find the most cost-effective solution. You can have business as usual in the global north, but that's fine because you can... Um, offset your emissions elsewhere so that the net um, um, amount of carbon that's being stored locked away in a tree um, is equal to the amount that's being released in a more polluting place. It doesn't work though. We know it doesn't because of these, there are many mechanical issues. In this paper, we talk about four of them. So they, that is access to sustainable finance. A lot of these projects have um, failed to find enough money to keep these going. Monitoring, reporting and verification and providing additionality. And there's also issues with land tenure as well. So here's an example here. This is Viridian. This is where I did my Red Plus research um, at the beginning of my PhD career. Um, they have created this credit card so you go and you buy your trainers on the high street and what they do at Viridium is they they offset the embodied emissions from your purchase by buying an equivalent number of carbon credits to uh, uh, with the money going directly to Infinite Earth, Hong Kong based business. None of this money goes to the people who live in and around the Rimbaraya Red Plus project. Um, another one called Earth Token, they did promise that the money or, you know, the money, the fake internet money, um, cryptocurrency goes to people in Zimbabwe um, to off, well, to, to reward them, incentivize them for planting trees and things like that. In reality, none of the Earth Tokens um, ever made it to these people at the Kariba Red Plus project in Zimbabwe um because it's it's not legal for that to happen because um they are in a country that doesn't allow for that to happen um here's another example this is gain forests so with this project it allows local people to stake money onto this platform and if their forests thrive if there's lots more trees planted then they are rewarded with a cryptocurrency but if their forests become degraded then they lose their stake so this is the idea this is, crypto people like this they like making a game of it all um, but obviously it doesn't account for the people who live in the amazon rainforest um it, it doesn't account for the actual drivers of deforestation which are often not the local smallholders it is actually the big multinationals that are coming in um, it, it doesn't change anything on a big scale. This project was uh, sponsored by the United Nations Environment Programme. They were given a lot of money to put this together. Um, there's projects like Regen. Uh, so this, this uses real-time monitoring to prove additionalities, uh, but it involves massive amounts of surveillance, for example. So um, they put like little sensors in the water, and if the water quality improves, then they're automatically issued with a cryptocurrency. Uh, using a smart contract, for example, you can do it with the 
carbon content of the forests um, and anything you like obviously it's very spoofable because if someone were to find this little sensor this is what i would do i just pick it up and put it in a nice bottle of evian or something and then you'd get loads of money i'm sure they would do the same but there you go um there's lots of crypto people you'll you'll pick up on this very quickly if you do some reading into um uh, this space but crypto people hate governments um they see them as very corrupt entities so blockchain is being put to work to bypass these corrupt governments um, and they're using it a lot to um, put land registries for example on a blockchain so it, it av avoids the ability for corrupt governments to start um, moving bits of land around in their favor so um, this is being used a lot but it is garbage in garbage out um, it is just a database, so if if the information that's being inserted into it is incorrect or that it, it disadvantages indigenous groups, for example, then it's no better than a normal database. Just people trust it because it's a blockchain, um, but it does have lots of problems. Um, this is a project that I I thought was um, had legs originally um so it's quite an experimental pr project that allows forests to own themselves it's called terra zero um, and it's one of their projects called um uh, flower tokens so the idea is is that a sensor is put on a, a fuchsia a potted fuchsia and if it grows um the um value of a token associated with that future grows as well um so we could the idea is is that this could be scaled up to a forest so if a forest was thriving then the money in our pockets would be more valuable and if it died then the value of our currency in our pockets would die as well so interesting just an experiment just a bit of artwork really um but still maybe it could work in the future who knows um, so lots of conservation NGOs are using crypto um, just for fundraising. Um, a paper that I wrote uh, again, well two years ago now. So this paper focuses on several significant benefit trade-offs for conservation nonprofits buying into blockchain innovation. Um, it looks at donor engagement and fundraising, organizational governance, and uh, the provision of humanitarian assistance. I'll just quickly run through this. Um, so the, the problem that NGOs face, they say, is that young people aren't donating. They're more apathetic, not like older people that would always give money regularly to charity. Um, younger people are traditionally less likely to donate. Uh, they're more likely to use cryptocurrencies, though. So lots of NGOs are, are using these innovative ways of fundraising. Honu was a crypto kitty, uh, an NFT, just a picture of a turtle cat sold for 25,000 at auction that's nothing now obviously because you've got nft selling for 91 million um, and we've seen lots of other nft platforms that are trying to get kids involved in conservation um, using these game these games um, once you've raised all the money there you've got to get that to where your project your conservation project is being carried out and a lot of the time that those funds stay as cryptocurrency which has a lot of problems because it means that um the the money isn't monitored uh as it crosses borders because it's just make-believe internet money um taxes can't be raised um there's lots of these intermediaries that have started up like bitgive and uh libra tax and th what they they try and do is get people to convert their money into cryptocurrency send it overseas so you don't have to pay taxes but according to this report here by ActionAid they're suggesting that actually the majority of the world's conservation issues and development issues are because they're not raising enough tax so it could actually be that the, these cryptocurrencies are actually the cause of the problem rather than doing anything um event of much value to fix the the, the problem I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip over this quite quickly. But the the, the problem with moving to a crypto giving model of uh, philanthropy um, from a traditional one is that the, the power dimensions change fundamentally. Whereas you would have a big, powerful NGO sat in the middle there, if you can see on the left hand image, and you would have trusts and foundations that just have to trust the NGO, the experts, that they, they know what they're doing. They know the local foundations and intermediaries, the beneficiaries. Um, what crypto 
giving does is it removes the, often the need to have an international NGO. You put all the power in the hands of the donor and they can give money on some platforms directly to beneficiaries. Um, so uh, Dash Tech's charity, for example, is doing just that, where they donate funds directly to poor people living in Venezuela. Um, I mean, but this might sound like a wonderful thing, but uh, it can actually back, it has lots of um, issues with it. Um, surveillance philanthropy, for example, is, a, is a, a big issue that I can see. So this is a project called Promise. Um, and the surveillance aspect of this is very easy to see, I think. So they encode donations. So money is given to poor people because you can't trust poor people, can we? Because they'll just waste their money on sweets and things. This is what's going through these crypto people's minds. Um, so they, they donate funds as cryptocurrencies, but they encode the tokens with conditions. So they'll say you can only spend the money on food, for example, for you and your children or from water or for something else but you can't spend it on alcohol or cigarettes or things or a new motorbike or a computer something like that but obviously this is incredibly it removes a lot of economic sovereignty for poor people and says they're not deserving for the same sorts of freedoms that we are in the north just purely because of they they've been um they are poor um, often because of structural reasons. So lots of projects are pulling out as well of crypto, Greenpeace, because they're scared about the climate emissions. Um, there's a lot of projects are becoming embroiled in uh, scams and there's fears of uh, funding terrorism, for example. Um, there's, so there's lots of reasons why charities are pulling out. Greenpeace recently stopped accepting all cryptocurrencies. Sea Shepherd, though, and a few others um don't seem to care they uh, uh knowing the the problems that this this sort of uh, philanthropy has they're continuing with it anyway um so yeah there's it's all very transparent which it can be a good thing because you can actually look in people's bank accounts well it's not a bank account it's a cryptocurrency account and you can see all the transactions that are happening that could be a good thing but it's also a bad thing for the for the charity itself because they have they are drying their dirty laundry in public it's a saying that we have in the uk um and as Bram was saying earlier it's often the people in the global south the poorest people that don't share the same freedoms, um, economic freedoms and others that we have in the global north. And that's no different with this sort of philanthropy in the United Kingdom. You can do all of these wonderful things with your crypto currency. If you were to send that to Peru, you can't do anything with it. You can convert it to another useless cryptocurrency. But as I understand it, you can't just wander into a shop in Peru and buy things with your dog money. Um, but there you are. Um, there's loads of examples of crypto colonialism, um, which I, I'll steer you towards some of these papers um, where I talk about that. But a recent one here, this is WorldCoin. Um, this is a, a, a charity which is based in San Francisco. They've gone to Indonesia to a little village called Sukabumi and lots of other places in Java. Um, and they ask people to share all of their biometric data. So it takes a photo of their face, their full body, uh, it collects their fingerprints, does an iris scan, all of this, and rewards them with WorldCoin, a useless cryptocurrency, um, which is meant as a universal basic income system, but it, it could possibly be used um, for nefarious purposes. There's, there's been issues in terms of free prior and informed consent with this. Um, closer to home, for you guys, uh, in Spain, Fair Co-op um, have released their Fair Coin cryptocurrency. This is in Barcelona. Um, I've read mixed things about this. Uh, one of my co-authors has written a, a paper about this, Fair, Fair Coin, um, but uh, lots of people are saying it's just the same as any other cryptocurrency, fairly useless. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, with all of these projects, there's massive issues around potential for colonialism, neo-colonialism. Um, the Global South provides ideal real world testing grounds for a lot of economic experimentation. We're seeing this in Palau to uh, Pine Ridge reserves where there's lots of indigenous communities that are having this, these cryptocurrencies tested out on them and they're being told, oh, it's for economic sovereignty so you can bypass the corrupt federal government um, but in reality it's they're just guinea pigs um, with the hope that these cryptocurrencies can be rolled out further perhaps to the rest of the global north so much of this technology constitutes an intolerable hot potato for the uk and spain and wherever else but it seems that in the global south they're fair game you can test it on them no worries um, give directly an OMIS go, for example, in order to identify potential recipients that are most in need of assistance and to evaluate impacts. They, they ask beneficiaries to take a sort of saliva cortisol test. And if they show signs of relative stress, then they're rewarded in a cryptocurrency. Aren't they lucky? Obviously, they wouldn't get away with that in the UK, but they uh, seem to be in many parts of the global south. So in the UK, one in 10 nonprofits face bankruptcy at the minute. In the US, one in five donors have said they won't be giving until this is all over. Um, it might seem like an easy way to fundraise. Um, it, it might appear as if uh, technical fixes are all that are required to fix the um, mechanical faults of carbon markets. But what I see in my research is that with every one of these fixes, it creates new problems. It doesn't, it doesn't fix the old ones, it just changes their nature. Um, so I'm sorry I can't end with something, um, some more good news, really. That's not how I roll, really. But um, if you did want to connect and look at some of my other bits and pieces, um, I've got a blog, codeforest.org. Um, or just send me an email and we'll have a chat. Um, but thanks very much for having me. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Pete. Thank, thanks, Bram. Uh, it has been very interesting. We are looking forward to reading uh, the paper you, go, you quoted on Fair Coins. Uh, it's a very mainstream moment in, in Spain and in Barcelona. And I'm sure it will be very provocative and polemic in, in, the, in the academic circle. Uh, we need to move now to the next uh, session with uh, Max and Martin, but uh, we really appreciate your time and you being here during your holidays and sharing your knowledge. I'm sure that in the Spanish uh, public opinion uh, will appreciate your, your talks. Thanks, guys, and see you soon.